Praise the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we get started. Father God, we give you glory, honor, and praise. And we thank you, God, for being in this place. Can you not feel God's presence already? Thank you, God, for being in this place. Somebody open your mouths and just exalt him even now. I more of his presence in the room. Somebody say, hallelujah. God, we love you. God, we thank you. God, we honor you. We honor you, King. Thank you for visiting with us. Let your spirit be free in this place as we learn the gospel that you have sent towards us. Let hearts receive openly that all hearts under the sound of my voice be good ground. In Jesus' name. Amen. And it is so. You Amen. may be seated. Amen. Praise God. Today is going to flow really well with the statements that Pastor Keith just had you say. And I'm going to talk about receiving kingdom provision. Amen. Receiving kingdom provision. I'll go ahead and tell you the end from the beginning. The way you get it is to receive it like a child. Amen. Childlike faith qualifies you for receiving kingdom provision. Think about it this way. A child simply hopes and believes. They don't understand the concept of lack or the concept of things not going the way that they were promised. If a good father promises a child a sucker, by the time they get home, that child is looking for that sucker. They don't have an excuse written in their mind already about why they might not get it. There may not be provision. Maybe there is not enough suckers in the house. They simply know when we get home, I'm going to get what was promised to me, which is the sucker. Same thing applies with our provision. God promises it to you and he puts it in the spirit and then tells you you have it already. And it's your job to possess that which he already gave you. But you do it by believing simply the way a child would believe. Don't ask questions. Don't want to question it yourself. Don't negotiate with God. Simply say, I receive it. You said I'm the head and not the sail. I receive it. You said I'm above and not beneath. I receive it. You said I'm a lender and not a borrower. My credit score says something different, but I receive that which is in the spirit and you will possess it when you simply don't look at what your reality says, but what God says. I want to talk about receiving kingdom provision. There is one topic Jesus talked about the entire time he was on earth nonstop, and that was the kingdom of God. He kept saying the kingdom of God is like this, and then he would do something to show you the kingdom's move. Now, I want to show you in a way that uh, the way God showed me, and we're going to talk about uh, Jesus feeding the 5,000. Now, we've heard this many times, but I want to show you why this is so seriously important. Let me break it down to you this way. There is only one miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels other than the resurrection, and it's this one. None of the other miracles of all the miracles Jesus did did all four Gospel writers decide to include except this one. So there was something important that they all, see, there's three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, meaning they're so similar, we call them synoptic. And then John did his own thing. He still talks about Jesus, but he got a whole different set. He talks about something completely different. Even John put this one in there, along with all three of the other ones. Even the other three typically don't have the same miracles. You'll see it in two, but not three. But here, this one is in all of them. He's trying to tell us something about kingdom provision. I can go a little bit deeper and tell you that this is literally at the time that John the Baptist died. And if you study the word of God in the Old Testament, John the Baptist had to end his ministry prior to Jesus beginning his ministry. So as John was dying, this was actually occurring. He was starting the provision of the kingdom. Let's get into it. Mark chapter 6. I'm going to read it to you in two different of the Gospels, but we'll talk about all of them. Mark chapter 6. Before we even get to the feeding of the 5,000, I want to talk about just in general the provision that he was teaching during that time period. 
So if we go up and we start at verse 8, Mark chapter 6, verse 8, he's sending his disciples out with power. He's sending them out, and he's saying, I'm giving you power over unclean spirits. As a matter of fact, this is a very important time period. This is one of the only times when Jesus tells them to anoint people with oil. He was being very specific about having the oil. He then goes on and says, verse 8, And commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no script, no bread, no money in your purse. Be shy with sandals. And don't even take two coats. You, know, you understand what, what's, what's being said here? Jesus is saying, I am teaching you how to operate under kingdom provision. Amen. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, we love to say that Jesus said, Seek ye first. Yeah. The kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. But then it says, and all these things will be added. What are these things? Well, it tells you before that verse what those things are. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. I'll provide that. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. I'll provide that. It goes on and says, don't even worry about the troubles that you will run into till tomorrow because I will take care of those tomorrow when you get there. When you understand kingdom provision, you understand that by the time you have the need, the provision will come with it. Amen. You simply have to believe like a child and not worry about it and just go. He said, don't even take two coats. Take only one. Don't take any money. Don't take anything. When you get there, I will say, have somebody sustain you. Uh -huh. This is how he wants you to trust in him. When you can't see Amen. your way out is when we're supposed to be the most comfortable. Amen. Amen. When it gets bad and it's dark outside and everybody else is panicking, we're supposed to rest in the back of the boat like Jesus did when uh -huh. we sleep during the storm. Amen. And say, it's going to be all right. right. Y'all going to be all right too because I'm on the boat. <laughs> and Jesus takes care of me. Can I get an amen? amen? Continuing on, then it happens to where John is killed from here and ends his ministry, and Jesus officially begins uh, the sending the kingdom and speaking on the kingdom by teaching about feeding the 5,000. Let me break down this miracle, because it's in all four Gospels, so we'll touch on all of them a little bit, but let me concentrate starting on Mark, and then we'll do John chapter 6 verse next. So Mark chapter 6 in verse 31 it says, And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place. Let me stop here. Let me break down these gospels again real quick. So Matthew known as Levi at the time, he was a tax collector and he was very good at detailing. Matthew has the most details out of all of the four Gospels. Why? Because as a tax collector, one of the, your job descriptions is you have to be able to write in shorthand. Amen. So he most likely took really good notes. And Matthew gets a lot of details. Luke was a physician. He was pretty good with details too. He got his details from other people. Luke was not an eyewitness. He got his details from uh, interviewing people. John was with Jesus. John concentrated on the love of Christ. But Mark was a little different. Mark was really short and to the point. Mark is the shortest of the Gospels because Mark don't talk about none of the stuff that other people talk about, all the speaking and things like that. Mark cuts all that out. Mark just hits the miracles. Jesus did this, then he went and did this, then he pulled a fish out of the mouth. Mark doesn't give you details. Mark just wants you to understand the point. But for some reason, in this particular miracle, Mark gets kind of detailed. He says he they, they, they departed into a desert place. And then he concentrates on you understanding that the place that they went to was a desert. I need you to understand what a desert is like over in Israel. It's not just like saying this place is deserted. In Israel, when they say it's a desert, it's a desert. All right? Because of their failure to recognize who Jesus is, Jesus says, I'm going to proclaim that this place will become a desert. And then for the next 2,000 years, Israel would have been drove, driven from their land to the point where um, in the early 1900s, it was Mark Twain that went and went to Israel and wrote about it and said, this place is so deserted, I don't see how anything could have ever lived here. It was a desert. Let me break it down to you. God likes to move when we're in the middle of a desert situation in our lives. Amen. 
And so he goes on and says, For we have many coming and going, and they have no leisure, so much to eat. Verse 32 in Mark 6, verse 32 says, And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. See, he's concentrating on this thing. And the people said to him, departing, and many knew him and ran afoot thither out of all the cities and out went them and came together unto him. So Jesus over here trying to get away. But people heard that he was coming, so they ran to the desert too. Jesus was really going to the desert to get away. <laughs> but they said, we coming too? <laughs> And when Jesus came out, he saw much people and was moved with compassion towards them, because they were not they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. Remember that and put a bookmark there. They were like sheep, not having a shepherd. Again, this is Mark is the only one that records this. And he begins to teach them many things. And when the day was not far spent, the disciples came unto him. And said, this is a what? A desert place. <laughs> and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country, round about into villages, and buy themselves bread. For they have nothing to eat. And he answered and said, give them to eat. Give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? And he said, how many loaves have you? Go and see. And when they knew, they said, five and two fishes. And he commanded them all to sit by companies upon the green grass. Again, Mark don't put sort of details like this, but he wanted to make sure you know it was a desert place, but this grass was green. Come on. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and fifties. And when they had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave it to his disciples to set before them the two fishes and divided he among them all. And they all did eat and were filled. And they catch this. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 Men. That's just how the men. There was women and children there too. This is a miracle of kingdom provision. But I want you to understand it started when they were in a desert place. Same miracle, John chapter 6. Starting in verse 4. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was not. And I'm letting you know we're about to go into Passover. We're about to have that meal, the supper. Then he goes on and says, when Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come to him and said unto Philip, where shall we buy that these may eat? And he said this to prove him, for he knew himself what he would do. Verse 7 says, and Philip answered, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to take a little. Now I'm going to start breaking this scripture down so we can get an understanding. Kingdom provision. Let's talk about kingdom provision. God promised that we would live in prosperity. Some, some, and lately, people have been talking about prosperity almost like it's a sin. God says you will live in prosperity. He says, above all, I want you to live and prosper. He says, I give you provision so that you can live a prosperous life. Everywhere in the Bible, he described prosperity with his people. Yet a lot of times we seem to walk around operating in what is perceived to be lack. God says, I promise you prosperity. So it would make sense that Jesus would live under the same favor. So we have this misconception that Jesus somehow was this poor, broke Christian man that just did miracles. But that would not follow with what the rest of the Bible promises. The Bible promises to make us the head and not the tail. The Bible shows favor. And in the desert place, God said he sent Isaac to sow in the middle of the desert, in the middle of famine. And he said the same year he received a hundredfold on his seed in the middle of a desert. So if that's good enough for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, surely God will bless his son. See, there's a misconception that Jesus was broke. See, we, we, we have this scripture, there's a scripture, it says that he became poor so that we might become rich. But if you take comparatively from where he came from, Jesus, where they use gold for pavement, anything down here is poor. <laughs> and then 
Even if he somehow was born into a poor family, which the Bible doesn't say that. It says the only reason they were in the barn was because they didn't have room. It didn't say they didn't have money. It said they didn't have room. See, he humbled himself. The Bible says Jesus did not consider it robbery to be called equal to God. Meaning he was literally God in the flesh. He was equal to God. And yet even though he knew he was equal to God, he humbled himself like a child. And wanted to make sure that you knew that he wants every last one of you, the least of you. The ones that think that they, he's not even looking at you. He says, I know every hair that's on your head. I count them. I want you to know it. So I'm going to send myself as a seed and be born in a barn next to some cows so you understand you are who I'm looking for. And he humbled himself to be birthed in this manner of the worst situation. Can you imagine going into labor next to some cow dog? God did. With his own son. But he didn't stay poor. Because the Bible says immediately there were people starting to come and bring gifts because when you are under the kingdom of God, provision is automatic. Yes. Yes. Not only were there shepherds that brought gifts, but if you read the Bible, there were also three magi, three wise men, three kings, different names for them. And it says, I'm sorry, it says there were three gifts. It did not say there were three magi. It simply said there were magi. We assume it was three because there were three gifts. But if you know anything about the Magi, the way they traveled, they traveled in entourages. There was probably a lot of them. Yeah. And it was enough of them to scare the mess out of Herod. Yeah. And if you look at Jewish history, you understand that they were actually enemies. Enemy, Herod and the Magi didn't even like each other. They had some serious opposition. Yet the Magi risked it all, showed up in the middle, and said, we've been following this stuff. Let me break this thing down to you. Make sure we have an understanding. 500 years prior to that happening, there was a man in the Bible, probably the most prophetic man that I can think of in the Old Testament. His name was Daniel. And Daniel got dreams and visions to the point where he was able to see and tell all the history of what would come going into the future. And he continued to be elevated, not just by one king, but by several kings and several successions and several dynasties. Because every dynasty that took over, he still had had understanding so far beyond their understanding that they made him in charge even though he was the captain. And they made him captain over the Magi. And if you look in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel, who was so specific with his prophecies, he actually gives you a countdown to Jesus. You can take a count and add the number of days, he says, and it will actually bring you to the day that Jesus was walking down um, on the donkey being received on what we call Palm Sunday. Daniel was that specific. And he was in charge of the Magi. So you better believe he had at least a set of those guys. And they were some pagan guys. But he had at least a set that he said, there's a king of the world that's coming. I can tell you the date. You can look for the star. And it, through the generations, they were prepared and they had great wealth. So when it says they came with three gifts, the three gifts simply represented what Daniel told them would be. They brought gold because he was a king. They brought frankincense because he was a god. And they brought myrrh because he had to die. They had understanding, which is why they were called wise men. Jesus wasn't broke. Jesus was okay. <laughs> Jesus was blessed. And the Bible says by the time the Magi came, they came and they found him in a house. He wasn't in a barn anymore. He was in a house. He was okay. Jesus had provision. Let me keep going. It says that in several of the Gospels, it specifically says 200 penny worth is not enough to feed 5,000 plus the women and children. Well, they keep saying the same thing, 200 penny worth. So I looked up penny worth just to make sure I had an understanding. Because to us, it sounds like a small amount of money, a penny. But no, a penny worth was a whole day's wage, and they had 200 of them. When you put that in today's time, to give you an understanding, he had $30,000 in a bag while he's out there in the desert. <laughs> they didn't have Apple Pay back there. They had to carry what they had with them. So they carried a bag, and all they brought that day was 30 grand. And they said, we got 30 grand, but that ain't enough to feed all these people, so what you going to do? <laughs> Jesus was not broke. <laughs> Kingdom gives you... Provision. 
Let's keep going. And one of his disciples, verse 8, Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Understand, John is the only one who describes specifically that there was a child. It's important to understand it was a child because the Bible says you have to enter into the kingdom as a child. The child had simple faith. See, children don't think about the optics. They simply believe. The child was sitting there with 5,000 men around him, so probably 10, 15,000 people around him. I don't know why he's the only one that his mama thought to bring him some food. But he's the only one. And then he said, well, I got something. Here you go. See, us, we would have thought completely differently. I'm the only one out here in the desert. I got fucking hide this. I need to hide that. I got food. <laughs> I can't tell them to eat this real quick. <laughs> it's fish. Fish go bad fast. <laughs> they, try to, they try to get But he said, no, 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 no. I'm going to put this in the hands of Jesus because he was a child and he simply believed. And that's what triggered the kingdom provision. Amen. When you think like a child. Verse 10, and Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now, here again, we're going to see the same thing. Mark said there was green grass. But Jesus now says, now there was much grass in that place. So the men sit down in the number of 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples. And disciples to them that were set down, and likewise as many fish as they would. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that none be lost. Therefore they gathered unto them, filled twelve baskets of fragments and five barley loaves, which remained over and above them that had it is specific. The Bible wants you to understand. The writers of these Gospels need you to understand. He didn't just feed 5,000, but there was 12 baskets left yeah. over. When the kingdom kicks, provision kicks in, you're going to know it because you're going to have more than enough. God is not a God of almost enough. He's a God of over and abundance. I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Yeah. And so there were 12 baskets left over. See, if you look at the history of how Jesus typically performs his miracles, I believe he simply took the fish, put it in the baskets, handed it to the disciples, and tell the disciples to start handing it out. And what they couldn't understand is every time they reached in and put in something else, there was something else down in the basket. And by the time they kept going, it just simply kept growing. Instead of going away, it got bigger to the point where when they were done, all 12 of them had a basket and it was overflowing. That is kingdom provision. Do you understand that these things are not metaphors or stories for us to feel good. It's real. real. And you have access to it. There's so many ways I can go with this. Lord, lead me. <laughs> I don't have time to do everything that God has for me to be able to tell you guys. But this is it's just phenomenal. Let me break down what's happening here, and then, as a matter of fact, no, I'm going to read the scripture first, and then I'm going to break down what's happening, and I'm going to give you an example, and I'm going to sit down and let you guys just soak in the presence of the Lord and what he said. <laughs> Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, it says, And verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as a little child, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Who shall ever shall humble themselves as this child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let me show you something. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. It's going to go in talking about offense next, but let me stop there. When it says receiving one little child, you're receiving me, it is not talking just about physical children. Look at the context. It's saying, if you become like this child, then this qualifies as you. And then whoever receives you, receives me. When you get to the heart 
posture where you simply believe God under the humility of trusting in him beyond our natural senses, anybody that deals with you is dealing with me. When they bless you, they're blessing me. When they curse you, they're cursing me. Which is why it goes on and says, but... Whoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it were better for him if a millstone would be hanged around his neck and he would drown in the depths of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, but it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to the man that the offenses come by. He is letting you know, I am your protector. When you lay yourself down and just trust me, I take over the same way as a protective father over his child. And anybody that offends you, anybody that messes with your heart, anybody that hurts you, woe to them. It'd be better if they were drowned because I'm going to deal with them myself. So you don't have to. It is all about trusting in God as a child. Now, I want you to understand that what Jesus was doing here, he was showing that when you get your heart in this posture, he then becomes your shepherd and he takes care of you. Notice, again, Mark, which is the shortest of the Gospels, described certain things that he wanted you to understand. Number one, he said, it was like lost sheep. And Jesus said, well, I'll be your shepherd. Mark's the only one to describe that. Mark also said, I wanted you to know the grass was green. But he said three or four times before that it was a desert place. It, it was a desert place. It, it was a desert place. And he said, but he was a shepherd. See, Jesus never misses any part of your life. He counts the hairs on your head, meaning everywhere the Bible speaks or gives a promise, it always fulfills it. And if you operate under the perfection of faith, because the Bible says you are not perfect, but your faith will make you perfect. If you operate under the perfection of faith, then the word lines up perfectly and it has to take care of you. See, the thing that makes the kingdom of God so exciting is the fact that God made it automatic, which means Everything that when you access it, when you unlock a certain key, it automatically shifts and gives you the provision. There's nothing you have to do but rest and believe. That's all. Praise the Lord. So when this thing was unlocked, Jesus says, I'll be your shepherd. And he literally started acting out Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Let me uh, take a moment. And break this down for you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. They were sitting there in the desert place in want. But God gave provision. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. It was a desert place. But he said, when they sat down, it became green. There were two miracles that happened here. And it was green grass because it says, I made you to lie down in green pastures. So in order to activate him being a shepherd, the desert had to become a lush land. When they sat down, when you sit down <laughs> and just trust God, even the place that you were in that you thought was a desert place will become green grass. John said it this way, now there was green grass. <laughs> He leads me beside the still waters. The Bible says they were sitting there right next to the, the Sea of Galilee. And it was the daytime, so the Sea of Galilee was very still. Matter of fact, the Bible says that right after this, just to make sure that they understood what Jesus was showing them, he says he then sends them to that sea and then lets the sea get crazy and hey. lets the wind start coming. And then when they get scared, and this is after Peter walks on water, Jesus says, I was trying to see if you understood what happened with the 5,000 people when I fed them. Were you listening? They were by the Sea of Galilee, fulfilling Psalm 23. He leaded me down the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Luke's gospel describes that when he told them to sit down, he started teaching them about the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He sent them on the boat and the storms went crazy. But he said, don't be afraid because I'm with you. My rod and my staff they comfort me. Jesus came down off the mountain in the middle of the valley of the sea and walked on the water and said, I'm here. And then he 
made the seas calm and made the boat go to shore. He was fulfilling Psalms 23. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In John's gospel, you see what he finished teaching. When he was done teaching about the kingdom, he started teaching that I am the bread of life. And he also said it was Passover, meaning that night they went and ate. And then Bible specifically said, and Judas was there too. In the presence of your enemy, my, thou anointed my head with oil. That was earlier in the scripture. My cup runneth over. There were 12 baskets when Jesus is your shepherd, this is what will happen. Amen. You can be in the middle of the desert, he's going to make it green for you. Yes. You can be in the middle of the storm, he's going to calm the storm for you. And when he gives you provision, it's going to be so much you're going to have stuff left over and everybody will know. It had to be the Father. I have literally seen this happen in my life while, I was, while I've been here. I know that the scriptures are genuinely true, even for today. And what I'm trying to get and impress on us is to have actionable faith like a child. Because if you really believe, you will see the same miracles. Mr. Presley, are you saying I can see five fish and two loaves turn into 12 extra? Yes. <laughs> yes, I, it might not be fish. It might be in your bank account, but yes. <laughs> that will literally happen. There was a time. And, I, and now that I'm starting to, to go back and tell these testimonies, y'all know I got testimonies. I've got testimonies for days. I've been saying I've had a gift of faith because I had a gift of faith. I've seen miracles my whole life. But there, but God has started to walk me through many of these miracles and show me why they happened. And He even showed me as I got older why some of them didn't happen because certain things in me changed. So I had to go back and remember the child in me in order to access the same things that I was getting when I was younger. Let me tell you about my first job out of college. The very first job I had out of college. Y'all gonna, gonna think I'm crazy for how I acted with this, but I'm just telling you, I had a childlike faith. The very first job I had out of college, I'm sure I've told at least some of this testimony before, it was Target. I was working at a Super Target. I was working at a Super Target right after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. This Target was two hours from New Orleans. It was the closest city that hadn't been badly affected, so it's pretty much where everybody moved to. So it was overrun with the amount of people that had come to the city. They stopped my training short right after I got hired, and without even hardly training me, they sent me up there because they were overwhelmed with the amount of people that were in that city. They made me the overnight manager of a super target where I was in charge of inventory. I had two people below me as managers, and then about 100, 150, 200 employees that would do stocking of shelves. And there were so many people in the city that they had gone from one to possibly two trucks a night to a minimum of three trucks every night that had to be unloaded. So let me break down how difficult this was. My job was to get there at 9 p.m. On a good day, I got off the next day at noon. Then, because there was nowhere for me to live in that city, I had to drive an hour to the closest hotel to stay. Get a couple hours of sleep. Go back and do it again. Every night my toes were literally bleeding from how much walking I was doing. But that's not the difficult part. The difficult part was the people that were there that hated me. The employees loved me, had no problem with them. But management came against me like nothing that I can imagine. But the Bible says, my children, if you offend them, It'd be worse than a millstone being hung around your neck. He's letting you know you're going to go through a fence. You're going to go through desert places. Trust in me like a child, and I'll take care of you. So there was the store manager at the top. She was the daytime. There was a one lady under her. She was in charge of the whole thing. There was me that ran it. There were two other managers, a whole management structure. There was two managers below me, and then there were all the employees. The two managers below me, particularly one in particular, decided they absolutely hated me. And when I say hate, it was unprofessional as, as humanly possible, but God wouldn't let me do anything but show love. I would walk into a room and give the instructions for everybody, and then I would go out and do my job. Before everybody else would leave, the manager had been here a lot longer than me, but he was under me, would then begin talking about me publicly in front of all the employees, how bad I was, how horrible I was, how they were going to get me fired. I mean, just publicly just demolishing my name. 
And I had to sit there and keep going through this. And this lasted for months. And God would tell me every time I would walk into him, don't do anything but show him love anyway. Don't yell at him. Don't, don't cuss him out. <laughs> it got to the point where it got such a bad environment that the store manager who liked me came and sat me down and said, there's a serious issue going on with, the, with you guys. <laughs> and I need to figure out what I need to do. And I had to be honest with her about what was going on in the store. But I said, but everything will be well. All will be well. And if I got to go, I'll go. So I went on about my business. And they continued to hate on me. And you know, God wouldn't let me do anything but bring them stuff. I'd bring them food. I'd bring them treats. I'd smile at them. And I'd just show them love publicly and privately. I didn't have a bad word to say about a single one of them. Because God never put that in my heart. Amen. He said, just love. Humble yourself like a child. See, the adult in us. The adult in us has learned to protect itself. The adult in us has learned how you handle certain things. This is my money. This is my job. See, you don't need to understand. In the middle of all this transition, while this is getting hard, I'm still looking for an apartment because I'm still driving an hour away, staying in a hotel. Finally, I find an apartment and stuff is not looking good on the job, but I trust God anyway. So I sign a lease on an apartment. Now I'm stuck. And I don't even have a good job situation. And every time I come to work, not only am I, my toes bleeding, but they're talking about me. And it's gotten all the way up to management management. And they don't know what to do. And so but I just trust God. I remember there was a point where I was looking for furniture. I started furniture shopping. I needed my God apartment. I needed need something where to sleep. So I started looking for furniture. God gave me an amazing deal. I got a whole bedroom set. I don't remember how much I negotiated for a dollar for my bill. It was under $1,000. I got it all. I got the bed. I got everything. God blessed me. But then they went and they came to deliver it. And for some reason, the delivery my guy kept messing up and not delivering it to my house. And I realized after his third failed delivery that God was saving me from something. Amen. So I stopped calling. Then one day I get called into the office and they say, we have to make some sort of change. Something has to happen because the synergy in this place is becoming very bad. You know, the employees love you, but the managers seem to hate you. And on my way out, because we had to go ahead and mutually part ways, God had me do the most unusual thing to an enemy. God had me recommend the one guy that caused all the problem to take my job. Let me explain to you. He started showing me what was going on. See, I had been sent to the store, and they told me that this store was run so well that I would be trained by the best. But when I got there, I realized the woman that was directly over me had no special ability whatsoever. The reason the place was run so well was the two people that were below me, one in particular. He was fantastic at his job. It is really unusual when you have a hater and an enemy, and they're actually good at what they do. <laughs> Normally, they're hating because they're jealous. <laughs> But he was not just good, he was fantastic. <laughs> he was really good. The whole re they didn't even need me. The reason they ran so well wasn't because of her, it was because of him. And I started realizing the reason he hated me is because I was a young kid, fresh out of college, 21 years old, and I got a job over him just simply because he didn't have a degree. And they wouldn't give it to him. And for some reason, God gave me compassion on my enemy. Yes. And on my way out, I looked at the top, the top manager. She, we had a great relationship. And I said, I know this is going to sound naive and stupid. And I, I'm very full aware of why I'm leaving is because of this young man. But for your sake and because I respect you, I want to tell you the truth. I would give him my job because he is fantastic at what he does. And I have to part it ways. Now, I don't know what God ended up doing after that. God had me walk back into that Target a, a month or two later while I was still there and run into that young man. And they had moved him to the daytime, so clearly they didn't give him my job. <laughs> they had moved him. I think she was trying to see if the things that I said were true. I think she was testing me. I think I know that's what she was doing. But then we had a conversation, and for the first time, I actually told him, I recommended you for the job. This is the first time all of that man, man's hate melted. I just saw it melt off his face. He just looked at me. We had our first conversation as friends. We just talked. I said, I recommend you, because I don't know why they didn't give it to you. <laughs> I know that I recognize that you are very good at what you do, and I wish you the best genuinely. And went on about my business. Let me break down the provision that happened there, because I'm not kidding about this. When I left... 
not knowing how I was going to get anything, not knowing how I was going to pay for anything. God didn't let me get on unemployment. He didn't let me get any public assistance. Yet when I got my next job, I had more money in the bank than I had ever had in my life. First, they were supposed to take away a relocation bonus they gave me because I wasn't there long enough and let me keep it. Then they were supposed to cut me off and my paycheck kept coming. One or two paychecks showed up after that. Then even after the paycheck stopped, when I would write out checks like to my rent. See, I'm not stupid. I understand how math works. When you write a check out, your account goes down. But mine would go up. I write out $500. I had $1,500 in the bank. I write out a check for $500. When I look back in there, it's $2,000. That's not the way it's supposed to go. And it happened like this for two or three months where I was paid. And I was chilling. The baskets kept coming. It overflowed. The kingdom is real. And we are to seek first that. The government of God. And all these things will be added. When... It was time for me to take my next job. God gave it to me himself. And it was not even one I applied for. I, would, I remember where I was. because I'm, I'm walking around on the University of Louisiana Lafayette's campus for no reason at all. I got no business. I was just walking around looking. I remember I was looking up in the sky talking to God. <laughs> just walking out. I was bored. I had money. <laughs> I, had that day, I had no job. <laughs> I was 21. I'm walking around. It was at night, and I remember I got a phone call. And the phone call was T-Mobile. And they said, we need employees. We need reps. I never applied for T-Mobile. They said, well, we don't care that you didn't apply. We just need employees. I said, no, God has something better for me than that. But if you want to give me a whole story, you can call me back. I hung up. The next day, they called me back and gave me the biggest story. A job I didn't even apply for. And they were paying me double what I was making as a manager at time. And God gave me the only store that had an office, so I got to sit down in my office, and then he sent me every employee I needed, the most amazing employees, people that came out of the woodwork that are now regional managers that ran my store so I could relax the entire time that I was there. See, there is one place the Bible says that you're allowed to fear. It's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. It says the only fear you're allowed to have is fear that you do not enter into this rest. The only fear you should have is worry that you don't use your faith to get to the place where the kingdom is working for you and you can just rest. Work towards that. Because what I brought you was provision. And it's not provision you have to work for. It's provision you simply faith for. And I provide the rest. There's one other story I'd like to make sure you understand that's in the Bible. The fragments were full of 12 baskets. This happened another time in the Bible. It was the woman at Zarephath when Elijah was sent because he had called the family. Elijah, the one that said, it's not going to rain until I say it will. And it stopped raining for three and a half years. But then God says, I'm sending you to Zarephath. When Jesus brings up this same account, he makes sure you understand Zarephath was not a close city. It was far away. Jesus says, there were plenty of widows in the city where Elijah was. But I sent you to this one because of her heart posture. She had childlike faith. How do we know? Elijah showed up and she was at her last in a desert place. He said, give me something to water. She said, okay, here, here's some water. He said, give me something to eat. And she said, I don't have a cake. He had asked her for a cake. He asked her for a meal. He said, give me, give me something to eat. She said, I don't have a cake. I got this last little bit of meal. And me and my son are going to eat it and die. That's how bad it is. And he said, make me a, now that you brought up cake, that sounds good. Make me a whole cake first. <laughs> In today's time, under our typical mindset, that would have been on CNN the next day. Prophet takes widow's last meal. <laughs> but she said, okay. Like a child that gave up his last little meal and just believed and gave him a cake first. Meaning, whatever she gave him, there was almost nothing left for her and her son. That is faith. So God said, I had to send you across cities to find one with faith like that because it is unusual. They had widows right next to you, but they weren't ready. 
And God said, because of her childlike faith, her meal never ran dry through the entire family. Every time she went to dip in that thing, that thing kept getting bigger. Every time I dipped in my account, my account actually got bigger. Every time the disciples dipped into them fish, they ended up with more. There is kingdom provision that is beyond what our natural understanding is. And God says, seek that rather than the natural, and you will see provision that you don't qualify for. And it will bless everyone around around you. And everybody will be blessed because of your faith. Kingdom provision is different than worldly provision. And the Bible says chase that. That's the only thing you should chase. That's the only thing you should worry about. Because I came to give you rest. The word of the Lord is saying to this house I have provision and rest for you. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8 says, Blessed are those who hope in the Lord. You will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose roots stretch out by the river. It then goes on and lets you know seasons will change and famines will come, but that's okay because your leaf will be green. It says in the middle of the drought, your leaf will be green. It says, matter of fact, when it gets real bad, you won't even have to be careful. That's the words in the Bible, King James. So Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. It says, you don't have to be careful when everybody else is in drought because your hope is in God and I will give you more than enough. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He make me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He, everything God was showing us, he was saying, kingdom provision is here for this house. And if you simply believe the way the woman in Zarephath believed, if you simply believe the way the child believed with the two fish and the five loaves of bread, if you simply believe in the middle of the desert place, the provision that I will lay on you will be so great, everyone will know it had to come from God. And they will recognize it is dangerous to offend one of his children. And if they bless you, I'll bless them. And if they curse you out, curse them. You are under a covenant that is different. And when we access it with real faith, we will see real miracles and real tangible results. The kingdom of God is here to give you kingdom provision. God is in this place, and I can feel the spirit. Y'all feel it thick in here? Uh -huh. And that ain't just the heat. <laughs> it's thick. God wants to do something. There's, there's a move of God that he has in this place. And he wants to inspire faith in you. The kind of faith that makes radical changes. See, God is starting to break down and show me what my ministry is supposed to be. He's finally giving it to me. Oh, my Lord. ministry is supposed to teach about how to make miracles with regular occurrence in our lives. I've seen so many miracles just talking about them. You know, this crazy thing is I wasn't even testifying about these miracles until I started preaching. My half of them were done here. <laughs> I had never thought about it. I literally was living by miracles so often it didn't, it didn't register. I didn't even realize it was something special <laughs> until I started preaching. And then I was like, oh, God did this and that, this and that. All this stuff in the Bible was here. <laughs> so I read the whole Bible. I was like, that's my life. <laughs> it's faith, and that's what God wants to inspire. I want to leave one word with you to make sure that you have an understanding of this. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. But the Bible shows very clearly everywhere that you exercise faith, you see a miracle. Which simply means if you are pleasing God, we are supposed to see consistent miracles in our life. It is part of our mandate to exercise miracles even in today's time. And if you simply move on your faith, faith like a child, God says, I will show you and show everyone around you. He doesn't do miracles just for you. He does it for the world to see and they know that God is with you. 
Amen. He does it for his name's sake. So there ain't going to be no small little thing. It's going to be impossible on top of impossible. And it's going to happen while you're in the middle of a desert. Amen. 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 Anybody wants that the feeling of burning for an increase of their faith, and you need this fire to lift in you right now, and you want to come on up to the